This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The federal government is pledging nearly $200 billion to fund and reform Canada's health care system. The question is, will that be enough? Today's meeting between the Prime Minister and the country's premiers was short, just a couple of hours. So they didn't have time to dig into the details of the proposal, and there were no negotiations. CBC's Marina von Stackelberg brings us initial reactions. Canada's premiers have an offer on the table from Ottawa. The provinces and territories provide health care, but the federal government helps pay for it. Now it's offering to spend more. But the premiers say they're disappointed with the proposal. There wasn't a lot in the way of new, new, uh, new funding uh, that is uh, a part of this package that has been put together by the federal government. And so, um, you know, I think to, to say the least, I think we were a little disappointed at that. The proposed deal is this. The federal government will increase health funding by $196 billion over the next decade. That includes $46 billion in new spending. Some is coming right away. Ottawa will immediately send $2 billion with no strings attached. That's to help premiers fix urgent issues like packed children's hospitals, emergency departments and long surgery wait times. Ottawa also promises to up the amount it spends through the Canada Health Transfer for the next five years. That's the large chunk of money it sends provinces and territories every year to pay for health care. We just received that proposal today. Um, there's a lot of details within that proposal. We've only had it for a couple of hours and we want to ensure that we have the time to go back to our individual uh, areas across the country, our provinces and territories, and make sure that uh, you know, we see what does that really mean uh, for our areas. Ottawa is also offering a total of $25 billion for individual deals with provinces and territories to address their unique health care needs. But to get that money, premiers must promise to spend it on their health care systems, not something else. And they must use it for priority areas. Increase family doctor access, deal with procedure backlogs, support mental health, and improve how provinces collect and share health data. There is also $4 billion in new money to increase personal support worker wages and tackle Indigenous health issues. It is more money than it was yesterday. The provinces and territories have been asking Ottawa for years for more money for their health care systems. So the premiers say they plan to meet not within the next few months or weeks, but days to decide what to do with the offer so money can start flowing soon. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Evacuees from Pegwas First Nation could be stuck out of their homes for years while plans to build homes and mitigate future floods continue. As you saw last night here on CBC Winnipeg News, 900 evacuees from Pegwas First Nation are still out of their community, many with no homes to go back to. Hundreds of homes in Pegwas have either been condemned or need major repairs before they're livable. As CBC's Brittany Greenslade reports, the chief says it's been a slow process moving forward with the federal government. It's a frigid February morning, and it's no warmer inside this home than out. Well, no power. We see how everything has frosted up now. We haven't been home. It's one of the first times Daryl Sinclair has been back to his Pegwas home since it flooded nine months ago. You miss everything. You, know, you want to be with friends and neighbours and you want your family here. You're lost. That's, what, that's, how, I, that's how we feel. We're lost. You know, we want to get back home and come back to Pegwas and be home again. Looking around, it's as if time has stood still, but Mother Nature hasn't. The walls, windows and doors are frozen. A little frosty. Standing inside, the memories are flooding back. The water had come to this height. We, had, we were able to see our first step, but everything was underwater. It's dark. You can barely see right in front of you, but you don't need to see. You can hear what's below. It filled up so fast, we lost everything. All our personal pictures, uh, kids' clothes, everything. Wow. 
Water is still seeping in. Mold has taken over. Like dozens of others, his house will be torn down and rebuilt. But he doesn't know when or where. It's been a battle, but it's not the only one he's been fighting. Cancer on top of worrying about my, my home and family. I, yeah. It's really bad. All I did was pray. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I had people praying for me that we'd be all okay. and We're still here. He's been undergoing chemotherapy for months. Today, there is good news. He's in remission. The biggest fight is done. Huh? Now he can focus on getting healthy and getting a new home because that fight continues. Homes now have to be rebuilt at higher levels. It means adding elevation to the ground while also keeping a few feet of extra space empty underneath the first floor just in case. It's a process that has to happen to all of these previously flooded homes and so many others. Well, assessments are still being done. William Sutherland says it's likely they'll need to do that to hundreds of homes. I'm planning for worst case scenarios as well, knowing work with it, any dike work that's done could be jeopardized at some future time. So we still have to build up to the one in 200 year flood level, which is what our goal is on Pegwis, right? While Pegwis is the largest First Nation in Manitoba, Sutherland says it's also the most flood prone. But that wasn't always the case. In the early 1900s, the people of Pegwis were forced from their original land, close to Selkirk, when that city started booming. The land was forcibly surrendered, and the community was relocated to this basin, where floods are inevitable. Now they are left to find the solutions as well, which Sutherland and many others are hoping are more permanent. That's the ultimate goal that I have is to one day hear that announcement that although Peg was flooded, there has been no reports of damages and there's no need for evacuations. But those plans will take years, leaving hundreds of evacuees still waiting. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Indigenous Services Canada says it is working with Pegwis to address housing needs in the community. Based on damage assessments it has received so far, it says 36 units will be replaced, 38 others renovated, and six are still in discussion. Indigenous Services Canada says it has advanced around $270,000 to Pegwis to help with repairs so far, but no money has yet been forwarded to deal with replacing any homes. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu says the Liberal government is committed to moving as quickly as possible to restore and rebuild homes. For some people it might be longer than others and that's exactly what we've been doing. The real solution though is moving away from uh, a repeated flooding event and so the chief knows that. He's got a number of experts working with him to figure out how uh, the community can rebuild with uh, flood proofing that prevents those ongoing reoccurring evacuations. Haidu says they are waiting for details from Pegwis, and as soon as those plans are complete, the work can start. It will be done in stages with the goal of ensuring the company, or the community rather, excuse me, is resistant to flood events in the future. People experiencing homelessness are among the most vulnerable medically. A conference is now looking at how shelters and public health can work together to provide them better health care. The CBC's Elena Cole explains. At Siloam Mission, people experiencing homelessness can access health care services, but not all the time. Like right now, we have public health once a week. We have access to doctors for people experiencing being unsheltered and accessing services at Siloam when those doctors volunteer their time for free. So there isn't necessarily a concerted effort uh, and, and funding model to allow for regular access to public health, sorry, to primary health care needs within the shelter setting. This week, Siloam CEO Tessa Blakey Whitecloud is one of more than 100 people gathering at a conference in Winnipeg. The aim, looking at how shelters and public health can partner to identify the needs of people who use the spaces and improve health care outcomes. We'll talk many about many needs and many public health um, topics. Many of them relate to infectious diseases, to the environment in shelters, and to, and to mental health associated with uh, persons who um, use shelters. 
Manitoba's chief provincial public health officer says finding ways to better connect people with public health can help address gaps in the health care system. That we're looking for a barrier-free access to, to services, to health care. And when uh, people are living in shelters, living in poverty, um, uh, there are, are many barriers that uh, many people don't perceive. Physical access, culturally safe access, um, a timely uh, access that meets the needs of those individuals. So, uh, so we know there's uh, uh, the syndemic co-occurring epidemics right now of injection drug use, sexually transmitted infections. And so we really want to be able to limit the barriers to care for for both uh, both of those. Dr. Brent Rusin says ramping up public health's presence in shelters is one way to improve care in the short term, but it's important to listen to what people want. We want to be there to listen, to be able to provide services that they need, so this requires a lot of engagement to see what, what people need where they're at right now. Organizers hope this is just the start, a step toward finding solutions. Alana Cole, CBC News, Winnipeg. The Canadian Centre for Child Protection says in the last five years, reports of sexual luring have increased by 800 percent. The number of luring reports that have come in through its tip line, CyberTip, and through CyberTip.ca jumped to 2013 in 2022 from 220 just four years earlier. And it's not just that tips are going up, luring activity is up dramatically. The center says these days offenders have near unfettered access to children because they're using online platforms more and more. Parents can help by teaching children how to spot suspicious behavior online. Police want you to know a convicted, untreated sex offender has been released back into the community. They consider him a high risk to reoffend. 31-year-old Curtis Leroy George has a lengthy criminal record, including five sexual assaults and sexual interference involving a 13-year-old. The five counts of sexual assault were committed on five random females who'd been walking or jogging. He was also convicted of assault of a female correctional officer. His conditions of release include not being in Portage Place, the Canada Life Centre, City Place or the skywalks connecting those buildings. If you have any information about Curtis Leroy George, you're asked to contact Winnipeg Police. Imagine being able to walk out your door, get into a car that you don't own, and then just drop it off anywhere you want in the city without worrying about being charged with car theft. That could be a reality for Winnipeg Car Co-op members. CBC's Cameron McLean reports on a new model that offers greater flexibility for car sharing. Um, it's really hard to um, explain to people how much you save. Because Aaron Riediger belongs to Pig City Car Co-op. It's one of many modes of transportation she uses. For years, members have been able to book a car, pick it up from one of several locations, and bring it back at a set time. Now the co-op is preparing to launch a new free-floating service that lets people take a car from anywhere without having to bring it back to the same location. Riediger already has co-op vehicles available a short walk away from where she works. But right now she has to book them at least an hour in advance. Sometimes there's those last minute trips and there might not be enough cars and not enough availability. So it really increases that availability. Um, so it allows more people an opportunity to use the car share. So um, it makes their lives more affordable. The city's public works committee voted today to remove time limits for on-street parking for vehicles that are part of the service. They also got a look at a map showing where the new free-floating service would be offered. Co-op CEO Philip McCulloch says people will be able to leave the vehicles anywhere in that zone that street parking is normally allowed. It's part of a roughly 14 kilom square kilometer um, zone that encompasses many of the uh, inner core neighborhoods that we already um, provide service for through a round trip service. So you can think it's the West End, um, uh, West, you know, West Broadway, Cordon, Osborne Village, St. Boniface. A spokesperson for the Winnipeg Parking Authority says it expects the new service to launch in June. It will initially consist of 35 free floating vehicles allowing members like Aaron Riediger to simply get in a car and go. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. The city of Winnipeg has just posted a doozy of a deficit. Winnipeg went $83 million over budget in 2022. That's believed to be a record. 
Part of the problem was the record snow clearing bill last year. The pandemic also played a role. Early in 2022, Omicron kept paying customers away from Winnipeg Transit and drove up overtime costs. The city is required to cover this 60, rather $83 million hole required to, but that will nearly drain its rainy day fund. And that means there'll be almost no financial cushion for the city this year. You don't know what's going to happen, you know, in terms of world economics, the price of fuel. Uh, we've got uh, some labor negotiations that have to happen throughout the course of this year. So we certainly have some challenges and, uh, you know, uh, we're going to be working hard to keep uh, finances in order. The city budget comes out tomorrow. Winnipeg's mayor has promised it will include a 3.5% property tax increase and a frontage levy hike. Never before have the Manitoba legislative grounds had a statue honoring a First Nations leader. Louis Riel's there, but he's Métis. And that's about to change. The CBC's Ian Fraze has more on plans years in the making. You know, they're going to want this one to be you know, in a similar position. So they have this is where a statue unlike any other on the Manitoba legislature grounds will be placed. One that celebrates First Nations people and one that looks toward the legislature rather than away from it. Requiring everybody that comes into this building to, to walk past the, the, uh, the, the, gaze. The, the gaze of Chief Peglis. Bill Stead and John Perrin have spent half a decade working toward this moment, the first monument to a First Nations leader. They've chosen Chief Peguis. On Tuesday, the statue's pending arrival was celebrated. It's uh, really exciting that we get to share this together. Chief Peguis was a defender of First Nations rights and a helper of settlers. He brought four other chiefs together to sign the Selkirk Treaty of 1817. It gave land along the Red River to settlers. I don't think the settlers at the time, the Scottish settlement, would have survived without Peguis. The current chief of Peguis First Nation says there's still work to do to better his community's relationship with government. He says progress is being made like last week's signing of a child welfare agreement and this planned statue. As I said on CFS, it's about damn time. As for the new monument, two proponents with Indigenous involvement have qualified to design and build the monument. A final proposal will be selected later. It's hoped the Peguis statue will be unveiled by September of 2024. The monument, though, won't go where some people expected it to be where the Queen Victoria statue once stood before it was toppled in 2021. The province hasn't decided what will be built here, if anything. Ian Fraz, CBC News, Winnipeg. Our weather specialist Fiona Odlum joins us now. See Ian out there by the legislature. Yeah. Been the you know, nice weather. Yes. I Beautiful think jacket sunshine. I've done a little bit. I think he did. Yeah, wild. <laughs> <laughs> and you were remarking on how when you were coming up to the studio, you still saw a little bit of like the sunset. You know, it's just lovely, to, isn't yeah. it? Like it's before six o'clock at night mm -hmm. and it's still sort of bright out there. There's still light in the sky. Absolutely. 532. That's when the sun set today. And right now we're still sitting at a really comfortable temperature. Let's look at our current temps right now here in Winnipeg. Minus Five. Let's not forget that seasonal should be minus 10, and that's where we, I guess we are feeling that way with the wind chill. That's how it feels, but uh, it is incredibly nice out this evening. We are in for a really interesting 24 hours. I'm going to be honest, it's been exhausting <laughs> trying to get this just perfect for you. Let's talk about right now and what we know right now. This is Winnipeg in southern Manitoba. We can see that things look really nice and clear here. We're going to see moments of a clear sky tonight, and we're going to be enjoying that. But things are going to get complicated tonight. We're going to start watching for patchy moments of fog. Actually, it should be starting pretty soon, and then it's going to go away, and then it's going to come back. And... And we're going to look for fog throughout the afternoon tomorrow in Winnipeg. So right now in Winnipeg, we, we have a pretty great moment right now. The drive home has been going great. Road conditions are in tip-top shape. That's fantastic. Much better than yesterday. The story in the north, different. We'll get to that after the break. But let's talk about what we can expect tomorrow. This is where things have been getting a bit 
crazy. So this system coming in from uh, southern Saskatchewan is going to come on over to the border here, and it's really going to do its biggest number into Dauphin. Now I'm going to move out of the way, and you're going to see as it should push to Winnipeg, it disappears. So we're going to see maybe some trace snow tomorrow in Winnipeg. Not a whole lot, but my worry is that that stretch of road there, the Trans-Canada Highway, because it's going to be so warm, we could see some freezing rain along there. Temperatures dropping tomorrow night, and so in and around Winnipeg, that nice and easy drive we have today may not be the same story tomorrow. We do see some sunshine coming our way in towards Winnipeg on Thursday, which will be really nice. And that just sets the table for the weekend. Lots of sunshine on the horizon. Now, yesterday we were talking about the wind. We've got a little bit of a wind right now. It's not all that bad. It is it does rear its head again as we look towards Wednesday into Thursday. We get some gusts in there, but nothing into the 60s. That's when I really start to panic. But you can see that uh, the wind is actually rather comfortable. Okay, so what we're going to be looking for tonight is minus one degree at midnight and a foggy sky. Then after midnight, it starts to improve, and we're going to see a little bit of sunshine, but mostly cloudy minus six by 8 a.m. By lunchtime, we're going to see that fog coming back. Minus two, mostly cloudy and patchy fog, really light wind. So remember in January when we had all that rime frost? We could see that again tomorrow morning, and I'd love to see those pictures. You know me. All right, so tomorrow, excuse me, Thursday, we're going to see some peaks of sunshine, minus seven. A real little cold dip for us on Thursday, and then we start warming up again. Breezy on Friday, lots of sunshine on the horizon. And Janet, that is, there's no minus in front of that too. Two degrees on the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just, my brain just kind of inserted it automatically. I know, when I was inputting it, I was like, oh no, delete that. There's something good. wrong, something yeah. missing. We'll be watching, Fiona. Thank you so much. You're Check welcome. with you a, a little bit later in the newscast. Okay. The death toll continues to rise after a powerful earthquake yesterday in Syria and Turkey. Canada is sending $10 million in initial relief funding. We'll bring you the latest after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Canada is sending $10 million in initial relief funding to Syria and Turkey after yesterday's powerful earthquake. The number of confirmed dead after that quake has risen to 7,200 and it's expected to climb higher, all as international search and rescue teams flood into affected areas to help. Abby Kovacin has more on the day's developments. Almost everyone is looking for someone. In Turkey, this man listens for a woman's voice from under a flattened building. Near the epicenter in Gaziantep, a city of more than two million people, first responders are thanked for saving a life. <laughs> Many more lives are in peril across southeastern Turkey. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has now declared a month-long state of emergency in 10 provinces. We have a lot of people on the ground, uh, 14,000 was the latest figure, uh, with uh, 3,400 heavy lifting uh, cranes and machines. The rescue effort is growing, with search teams pouring into the country from around the world. For those who've been lucky enough to escape being buried under toppling buildings, now finding they have no homes to go to while facing freezing temperatures. <laughs> In Syria, too, that same fear. But a divided conflict zone means a divided quake zone. Opposition-held areas already had scarce resources. The United Nations says the one route into the region is no longer usable after the quake. Here, the white helmets continue to operate, doing what they've been doing throughout the civil war, pulling people from the rubble. <laughs> Look, look at your father, the rescuer says to the toddler buried up to her chest in debris in the town of Jinderes. Her little face, covered in dust, turns to look. Noor is alive, seeing the light after more than 24 hours of darkness. The white helmets say there are thousands more to be saved.
as we know, at, at, as the time passes, we, we lose, we lose people. It's bigger than us. It needs international efforts. But there is concern the Assad regime set on gaining back lost territory may prevent aid from reaching opposition-controlled areas where more than 4 million people face a looming humanitarian disaster. Abby Kouadas in CBC News, London. A former member of the Canadian Armed Forces is no longer receiving updates about the Afghan military interpreter she's been trying to bring to Canada. Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada stopped sending the information after she talked to CBC about her efforts a little earlier this year. The department insisted she and the interpreter, who is in hiding, fill out a new web form to grant them access, but that information remains inaccessible and the interpreter's life remains in danger. CBC's Rafi Bujikanyan has the latest. The frustration is unreal. Since Kabul fell to the Taliban, Lisa Compton's been trying to help the Afghan military interpreter who shielded her years ago from a bombing attack come to Canada with his family. They have had threats. He's had to change his SIM card numerous times. Compton is a retired Canadian Army nursing officer. The family she's trying to assist got to Pakistan from Afghanistan. Since 2021, she's been representing them with Immigration Canada, getting updates on their files faster than they could. He's terrified. Last month, she told CBC News about the year-long wait in their processing. After that, she was told he must fill out new paperwork so she can keep representing him and his loved ones. Kind of absurd when you realize that you're informing, uh, you know, the, the IRCC that this gentleman is running uh, and hiding from the Taliban, and his family has to flee constantly from one place to another, and now they want you to update a form. The two documents barely differ. They ask identical questions. The newer version replaces the Immigration Department's former name, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, with the one the federal Liberal government adopted in 2015, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. It definitely causes um, delay and potential access issues. This immigration lawyer says it is unusual for the IRCC to request new forms unless there is some kind of change to the representative's info. Vulnerable claimants who are in uh, risky situations uh, have difficulty um, submitting their applications and their supporting documentation. But the email we've seen from an IRCC staffer to Compton just says they are unable to process the form since she provided an earlier version. We went for our nighttime. The interpreter says he snuck out after dark from his temporary shelter near Islamabad to fill the document online. We're hiding his identity and even his voice to protect him from repercussions. We are still waiting. Though the IRCC has received the new form, it tells Compton registering it could take up to 10 business days. The department would not discuss individual cases with us, but in a statement it admits an applicant's form would typically remain valid unless there were changes to be made, such as contact info. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Reaction is growing in Quebec tonight after revelations that New York City, which is experiencing an influx of migrants right now, is paying for bus tickets for migrants who want to go to a small town near the border with Canada. It's near a location where there have been a number of people crossing the border in between regular entry points. Sarah Levitt has more. I'm in Plattsburgh, New York, about a 30 minutes drive away from the illegal border crossing known as Roxham Road. Now, tens of thousands of migrants have crossed into Canada seeking asylum. It's at this gas station in Plattsburgh that the migrants are dropped off after traveling via bus from New York City. Organizations have already been helping by paying for tickets, but in an article by the New York Post, it was revealed the city of New York is also providing funds to get these migrants out of that city. New York Mayor Eric Adams has been vocal about his administration's concern about the influx of migrants. Here's what he had to say in an interview with Fox News. 
if they're seeking to go somewhere else, we are helping in the reticketing process. Uh, what we found that people had other destinations, but they were being compelled only to come to New York City, and we are assisting in interviewing those who seek to go somewhere else. Some want to go to Canada, some wants to go to warmer states, uh, and we are uh, there for them. Quebec's immigration minister has said the situation is urgent, that the fact that New York is doing this shows the agreement which allows these migrants to cross illegally needs to be renegotiated and resolved. Organizations that are helping migrants say that this is a political issue and the problem isn't necessarily free bus tickets. Once they're here at minus 20, the shelter paid by the government tells them that it's over, that they don't have any more nights for them to stay at the shelter so that they have to go out and that they don't have money, they don't have resources, and they end up in the streets. That, to me, is the part that is shocking, not the fact that they've been given tickets to move freely and to not have to pay for that. For many migrants who arrive here, it's a, another step in their bid to find safety and a new home. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Plattsburgh, New York. Make Poverty History Manitoba wants to know how you think our provincial government could make life more affordable for people here who have low incomes. We'll hear about the consultations it's holding this week after the break. Then Fiona Odlum brings us the Manitoba forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Manitobans will vote in their next government later this year. The group Make Poverty History Manitoba is holding community consultations this week to hear ideas and find out what people want their government to do to reduce poverty. I spoke with one of the people leading these consultations, Molly McCracken, this afternoon. Thanks for joining us, Molly. Thanks for having me. Now, you work with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. You have study after study on poverty reduction at your disposal. What do you get from these consultations that you don't get from studies? Well, it's important to talk to people with lived experience of poverty and those who support them so we understand what's happening on the ground, um, particularly as the cost of living is skyrocketing and we're still, um, you know, dealing with COVID. Um, so we had a really good consultation earlier today. Was there anything in that conversation that surprised you? It seems that everybody is urging for more income supports for people uh, just because the cost of living is so high. And um, one example was given is when people turn from 64 to 65, they get old age security. Um, so effectively at 65, they have much larger supports than they do at age 64. But the only thing that's changed for some folks is their age. So why can't um, an income support support program like our proposal, which is a livable basic needs benefit, be available um, to all people who are living below the poverty line on provincial social assistance. Um, that was one really good example of our conversation earlier today. And are and we more, know and more Manitobans slipping below what we might call the poverty line, however we measure it? Well, what we've seen recently is that poverty actually went down statistically because of the federal SERB benefit. And that $2,000 a month made a real difference in the poverty rates. But now that that's ended, we are seeing it go back up again. So we're seeing that this um, government transfer has helped people, but we know that Income transfers aren't the only thing that people need to be able to afford housing. So we also need affordable housing, um, available child care, mental health and harm reduction supports and a number of other things that we learned about today. You have another session coming up on Thursday evening, an in-person one. What will you be looking for there? Yes, we did online today and then in person at Knox United Church. Um, well, we just haven't been able to get together in person in so long. So um, reconnecting with people and asking them what their experiences have been, sharing some of our uh, research. There's a We're a big tent coalition, Make Poverty History Manitoba, of a number of different groups. So sharing what our research has 
done. What we've actually been able to accomplish as a coalition, um, you know, we have seen some change in childcare, for example. We have seen some change in minimum wage, although it's still too low. Um, and then what people, what the priorities are for um, Manitobans um, in terms of this upcoming provincial election. What do they want government to do to end poverty here in Manitoba? And how hopeful are you that you could make those issues actually part of the campaign? Well, we have been successful in the past and uh, people are really energized today uh, because I think we're all feeling it, the cost of living going up. And we're also seeing more visible poverty in our community. Uh, even though I talked about the stats going down, I think there's certain groups that are becoming more entrenched in poverty. So we know we have the tools at our fingertips. The Manitoba government actually has legislation that requires them to have a poverty reduction plan. They need to have a target and timeline to bring down poverty rates and ultimately end them. And people today were really energized about coming together to push the province and the electorate to think about what more we can do to bring down poverty so that everybody can have good health, well-being, and contribute um, in our community. Molly McCracken of the Make Poverty History Provincial Working Group, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Fiona Adelman joins us once again. You were saying we might get some of that beautiful rind frost that makes the yes. trees so pretty. Yeah. I know absolutely. you love your viewer photos. I love viewer photos. I love getting them. And I promise you, like, I'm not just like talking about supper time and what we're eating in this next photo. Cause yesterday it was that beautiful owl in the snow eating the bunny. <laughs> this is another eating photo, but less macabre, I promise. Let's take a look. Here it is. It's a snow bunting eating a piece of sunflower left over from the summer. I'm okay with that. That's okay. <laughs> Less graphic than yesterday. But you know what? This picture just makes me so darn happy. Uh, Steph said that her yard could fill up with hundreds of these little birds bopping around in the snow. And they found a little bit of uh, last summer's sunflower there. And that sounds like a really great treat. Thank you so much. Always send me your pictures. I love sharing them here on the show. Current conditions. Minus three at the Forks, minus six in St. Laurent, and minus three in Steinbeck, minus two over in, in uh, Morris. Now, it's going to get a little bit warmer as you look towards uh, the west there. There's this big gust of air, warm air coming towards us, and we're going to see a big warm-up tomorrow. We will see a big change even in the Churchill area where we're sitting at minus 24 this evening. Okay, this... It's like a Disney movie. It's the tale of two storms. Here's the first one. This is what's happening right now into the northern portion of the province, where we, we're going to see a good couple of centimeters with this storm, and it is going to start moving. This low is going to move away. But then we have this second one, and it starts coming through in towards us from Saskatchewan, and it really just falls apart before we get to Winnipeg. But the bulk of this storm does swirl around Dauphin and Brandon, looking for about five centimeters of snow there. Lots of sunshine coming towards us on Thursday, and another little drift of snow here along the 60th. That could be a little issue for us. Fog, a big factor for us in the next little bit. Look at this. Uh, so around 11.30 tonight, zero percent visibility there and in Winnipeg. We're going to see that consistently through uh, out the day tomorrow. So anticipate some uh, delays in your travel. Snow, to, this is that first storm coming through the north. So two, three centimeters left in there and uh, maybe four in towards God's Lake, the southern portion. We don't see any really until midday tomorrow. And then it starts pushing through and we'll see about a centimeter, three centimeters into Brandon. I think we're going to see more in Dauphin. Tonight, we're going to be watching for a mostly cloudy sky in northwestern Ontario, uh, maybe a little drifting snow towards Dryden and minus seven. We're looking for fog patches and a mostly cloudy sky, some peaks of moon tonight. We're going to watch for an increasing cloud in Swan River and Dauphin as well. 
into the north. That's where we're going to see that snow, but mixed with fog. It's going to be a bit tricky tonight navigating the roads. A bit of fog tomorrow morning to start our day off, and then we're going to see that clearing away. We're going to be looking for patches of fog and freezing drizzle as we look towards Dauphin and Brandon tomorrow. Be careful on that Trans-Canada Highway. Watching for freezing rain, there's a chance of that in Winnipeg and a high of zero. As we look to northwestern Ontario, the snow that we've seen from that system that was in Winnipeg is going to drift to northwestern Ontario, Janet. Thank you, Fiona. Mom, I can't hear your voice at the moment. I can't hear the softness of words that are comforting. Can't recall the softness of your face. Residential school survivor Vivian Ketchum reads a poem she wrote to her late mother after the break. A very special first person story coming up. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. When Vivian Ketchum learned about possible graves found around the site of a former residential school near Kenora, she immediately thought of her late mother who'd attended that school. That's when she did what she often does during times of pain. She wrote a poem to her mom. She was a fighter, a scrapper, a grandmother, mother. She loved her family, despite what um, history tried to tell us. She, was, she did attend um, St. Mary's Indian School in Kenora, Ontario. I think she was about 13 or 14 at the time. It's heartbreaking to, hear, to, to know that possibly of her history and that when she told me about her hair getting cut by the nuns and that and to see the tears in her eyes and I remember her boating going boating with her fishing and that she'd come and pick me up put us in the boat then we go down to Shoal Lake and this is where the the picture is we we're stopping by for a shore lunch those are the memories that I want to hold in my, when I remember my mom but I also want to um, let the public know about her, her time in residential school. I want her voice to be heard. The news of the unmarked graves broke out. Oh, this hit me really hard. And um, even though my mom has passed on, I still kind of um, want to write to her as a way of reaching out to her for her to comfort me in that. Uh, it was a healing, my way of um, healing myself, reaching out to my mom for comfort. Mom, I can't hear your voice at the moment. I can't hear the softness of words that are comforting. Can't recall the softness of your face. How your hair used to curl in the hot summer days. Mom, I need to feel your presence. I'm feeling lost. I'm feeling angry, feeling a load of grief. Has the news of today of the 171 anomalies found at your former school deafened your presence to me? Possibly little ones, cousins, aunties, uncles. No, little one, I have not forgotten you. I am dancing with the relatives found grief for now but dance with us, for they have found them. They're not forgotten. Dance, little one, for they found them. A 24-hour support line for anyone affected by residential schools is on your screen. It's 1-866-925-4419. Fiona Odlum is back with your seven-day forecast, and then we'll have your daily lift. Stay with us.
we're in for a bit of a tricky 24 hours. We've got a little bit of snow and freezing drizzle and fog on the way towards Winnipeg, looking for a daytime high of zero degrees. But then we cool down on Thursday, and then after that, we warm up significantly, and we see lots of sunshine for the weekend, Janet. Positive temperatures, that's just... Yeah. Odd. It is. <laughs> Winter, you know, it's weird. It can be tough, yeah. though. You either love it, hate it. Sometimes you just have to tolerate it. Yeah, exactly. So I went out to a Cole St. Norbert immersion and asked the grade two class how they felt about the season. Here's your daily lift. I do not like that winter that much. How come? It's too cold. That snow always gets in my boots. I like winter because it's fun and it's and the snow's soft. I like winter because I get to make lots of snowmen and I get to fall into the snow. <laughs> my favorite thing about winter is I like to build snow forts. Have you built a snow fort? Yes. What did it look like? It looks kind of similar to a castle. Doing the snowball fight. Making snow angels and that stuff. I like to do um, snowmen, um, snow angels sometimes. Do you like getting dressed up for winter? No, I hate it. <laughs> sometimes I don't like snow because it gets in your face. <laughs> How does it get there, Mark? Like if you fall and then your face gets covered. Yeah. I play with my brother and have really, I have so much fun. I don't like winter that much. Because it's too cold and snow is everywhere. I kind of like winter because I play hockey. Do you like uh, the cold? No. <laughs> I like winter because I can play hockey and I can play I can make igloos. I usually just play in it and make like drawings in it. You, so you do art in your igloo? Yeah, I just bring a pencil and trace stuff that I want to draw out of the snow. Last week it was really cold. What did you think about that? I hate it. <laughs> That girl, she was fantastic. I, I loved her honesty. It was Absolutely, perfect. and we all love your laugh. <laughs> Don't you just love Fiona's laugh? Thanks for getting that. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow night. Yeah, see you back here at 11.